When you think of modern animation, you probably think of the most recent Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem film, or maybe the Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse that came out a while ago. And as stylized and CGI reliant as that, and a lot of modern anime as well is, all of it still owes a pretty incredible debt to the way that we think about how to animate action in a believable way. To Superman. Yeah, Superman. Uh, who originally before he was animated, couldn't fly. This is the story of how one studio helped to take modern animation and Superman from making giant leaps to flying. I'm Dan Upton, and this is the Doomcast. Do me a favor, hit subscribe and the bell. I make about one of these videos a week. They're all great, so please don't miss even one. Now, the early history of animation is about as quaint as the early history of motion pictures, and the two of them grew side by side. Arguably, their origin is almost the same. The zoetrope, the little rotating turnstile that has an image uh, displayed on it that uh, flickers and it gives the illusion of movement, that's existed for a very long time. Uh, but the, animation really grew in its own way out of sequential art. And when you consider that the first real comic strip of sequential art in newspapers was A. Piker Clerk in 1903's Chicago American, it really doesn't seem that long ago. Now, early cartoonist Max Fleischer, who was employed creating some of those newspaper comic strips shortly thereafter, uh, had become a pioneering animator with his brother Dave, and they began creating experimental animated shorts as early as 1914. And by 1919, they were working at the Bray Studio with another very well-known early cartoonist and animator. That cartoonist, John Randolph Bray, produced Max and Dave's Out of the Inkwell series, which featured early animated character Coco the Clown. Now, what set Max and Dave Fleischer apart was a novel invention Max had created with the intent of developing realistic movement and animation at 24 frames a second, a device called the rotoscope. This was essentially a projector that moved frame by frame onto a clear glass drawing table, allowing the animator to trace movement as smoothly as the human eye could perceive it. Now, what it did for animation was revolutionary. While Walt Disney's methods initially were very different, uh, when Fleischer became an independent studio in the late 1920s, their cartoons were arguably more well-known. Obviously, Disney set itself apart through their own means, making feature films. In time, of course, the Fleischers would too, but Fleischer's early cartoons included comic strip characters like Betty Boop, debuting in 1930, based on uh, flapper icon Clara Bow, and later Popeye, based on a comic strip Thimble Theater. They also ventured into feature-length films uh, at the behest of Paramount, eventually their studio partner with 1939's Gulliver's Travels. But by the late 1930s, Fleischer had fallen on somewhat hard times, as had most people in the late 1930s, despite Fleischer still being a cultural touchstone. A Paramount penalized them for going way over budget on Gulliver, and their contract for that movie wasn't especially favorable to Fleischer to begin with. But in 1938, a new character, Superman, debuted, featured in Action Comics, as well as eventually immensely popular radio serials in which the character fought. Robots, uh, Klansmen, other villains, both real and fictitious. By 1941, Paramount had acquired the film rights and commissioned Fleischer to create an animated series based on the character, based in part on the radio serials. There were a few things that Fleischer Studios found problematic. First, the tone. Most cartoons at the time were not serious and didn't feature any kind of fantastic or semi-realistic depiction of violence, as was definitely suggested with Superman. The action was very new as a concept. Superman was a caped crime fighter, similar to Batman or the Shadow at the time. His powers included being very strong, fast, bulletproof, and able to leap long distances and over great heights. Yeah, you noticed something important there. Superman couldn't fly at the time. In fact, there was a whole lot that Superman couldn't do. Um, he couldn't do heat vision or freeze breath. He did not yet have a weakness to kryptonite. That was going to be introduced some years later. Uh, but Fleischer found, after animating the leaps over the buildings, it was functionally impossible to do with a rotoscope in a way that didn't look really stupid. 
Uh, supposedly, Max Fleischer hated it so much that he begged the studio to let them do something different. So, at that point, once they realized that they could animate flying in a way that didn't look super silly, that was it. Superman could now fly. It was that easy. And Superman's powers weren't the only thing that became different. There was a distinct redesign to Superman's costume. Uh, well, subtle from what had been published in comics, but beyond that, uh, there were also distinct animation differences in the way that the city of Metropolis was portrayed. A distinctly Art Deco style that ended up getting copied by DC Animation later for Batman the Animated Series, almost 50-some years in the future. The Fleischers, however, were not invulnerable like Superman. The brothers eventually parted ways, and the studio abs was absorbed by Paramount Pictures and then renamed Famous Studios. Now there, their longtime associate Seymour Nitel and others produced eight additional episodes of the Superman cartoon for a total of 17. Now those last episodes ended up being more specifically centered around World War II propaganda than the first few. Some of them were obscenely racist. And of course, Superman cartoons ended after those mere 17 episodes. Uh, it's hard to imagine how the legacy of these cartoons and the Fleischers remain so indelible to this day, especially when you consider that these were shown over and over as serials in movie theaters, usually uh, prefacing another Paramount picture or maybe newsreels. The way people digested cartoons and animation at the time was entirely different from the way people do today. When you look at the techniques and you look at some of the choices that they made, it's kind of easy to dissect and, and understand why that still means so much. The use of rotoscoping and Fleischer's rotograph eventually allowed for a distinct method of animation and animation over live action even, that was later employed by animators like Ralph Bakshi, Don Bluth, and even Disney later on. And the look of Superman cartoons distinctly influenced the resurgence of animation for DC Comics and superheroes for almost 80 years later, beginning in 1992 again. But perhaps one of the biggest effects that it had was it made Superman a character that at once was without limitation, but limited only by what the writers actually needed. Eventually the weakness to kryptonite, freeze breath, heat vision, a lot of other Superman lore was opened up to change by Fleischer's choice in that moment and solidified their indelible legacy. Well, thanks everybody for watching. I appreciate you checking the Doomcast out. Like I said, do me a favor, hit subscribe and the bell. Come back next week. Um, once a week here, uh, my friend Damon and I are covering Star Wars Ahsoka, so check that out as well. Usually those will drop close to the end of the week after the episodes come out. Once again, thanks, take care, have a great week.